From KCRW, this is Here Be Monsters. I remember for a lot of my childhood thinking that racism was in the past. But there were instances where, like, six-year-old classmate would be like, you can't hang out with us because you're brown. My teachers, I feel like, just took such measures in making sure that I didn't actually feel racism, that these kids didn't know what they were saying, it was the first thing that came to their mind, and it didn't have anything to do with racism. And then in middle school, I remember being in the cafeteria um, and trying to sit with my white classmates and them being like, oh, you can't sit here because we're saving this spot for someone. I remember like sitting down with like Hispanic classmates who were not in my class, but like looking around me and noticing that like we were all Hispanic sitting on one side of the cafeteria and the white kids were sitting on the other side. And specifically the white girls that told me that they were saving a spot for someone did not have someone sitting in the spot that they were saving. Like, it was just a clear, I think it was just the first click of like, I think this is racism. But by high school, it was just like, wow, like people are blatantly racist. And I'm lucky in that the racism I've experienced has been pretty minimal and it's probably due to how light-skinned I am for a brown person. Can I have you tell me about the the first police shooting that you were aware of? Like a lot of people, it was the shooting of Trayvon Martin. I was in high school at the time. I was a junior, um, and I was living in Florida, so pretty close to the incident. He was a, you know, he was a high school student. Like, Trayvon Martin looked like classmates of ours. It could have happened to any one of us. Being so close to the situation, being in the same state, being nearly the same age as Trayvon, um, it just is really hard not to just think about that a lot. Like emotionally, I think, I mean, I was very sad. I just couldn't believe that people believed that Trayvon Martin deserved to die because he had a hoodie on and because it was dark and because he appeared to act like an adult you know like I just it's definitely anger even now actually I'm not noticing I'm getting really tense it didn't feel like there was a lot of hope I think that's what it comes down to is like you know Trayvon Martin had died and there wasn't a lot of hope that people could see that it was a social injustice that it was like a human injustice it sounds like it stuck with you it has stuck with me I mean, there have been there have been so many other shootings since then, and there was a lot of publicity into the trial of Darren Wilson uh, over the murder of Michael Brown. And I remember I'm I'm not sure if it's common. I remember just thinking that it was really unique or really great that the transcripts were available, like the written transcripts were available, and I just felt like I needed to read them. Um, there's a pretty famous quote where Darren Wilson was saying that Michael Brown had, quote, the most intense and aggressive face, unquote, um, and saying that he looked like a demon. Um, and just, it just sparked, right, even right now, it's sparking memories of Trayvon Martin. You know, this like, they looked, they looked angry, they looked demon-like. I think just, yeah, again, it comes back to this anger of like, why aren't we trying to protect this injustice from occurring I think apathy is really dangerous. I think I think I also I kind of pay more attention to cuz I'm afraid that I also will be apathetic one day towards all the shootings that nothing's going to get done. Here Be Monsters, the podcast about what justice requires of us, the podcast about the unknown. All right, let's test you. Let's have you say some, say some stuff. Toast, toast, toast. I don't know why toast is so fun to say, toast, toast. 
My friend Natalia Montez says she prefers the racism she experiences in Seattle to the racism she experienced in Florida. It's more polite, less obvious. In her experience, most people don't want to be racist. They just can't help it. She doesn't hold it against people because it's not something anyone chooses. It's something we unconsciously learn over time. Natalia used to work at a social science lab that researches implicit bias, the kind of unconscious, split-second prejudices that everyone has. The way I understand implicit bias is that to obtain something implicitly can be done by observing others that have a bias and kind of mimicking those behaviors, especially when your parents have a bias. You tend to take on the same biases, even though you don't have any conversation about these biases. Most notably, it's how police officers perceive Black men and people of color in general as more violent or likely to commit crimes or be threats. They see young Black people as more adult-like than they would, you know, white young people. It's not necessarily something where, you know, they were in school and they were given flashcards of Black faces and told to associate them with threats. It's that, you know, media often portrays Black people in that light, Um, people's family histories, stories that have been passed around, you know, that kind of creates implicit bias. Natalia studied psychology at the University of Washington, and she took a class on neuroethics. Her class, a philosophy class, studied the mind as an organ. They looked at how medicine and technology might be able to affect things that we typically consider more social than scientific. Natalia focused on implicit bias whether it can be treated like a medical condition. And she found this small study out of Oxford University in England. The point of the study was to see if implicit bias could be reduced, temporarily, with medication. I stumbled upon this study done at Oxford University where they were testing the effects of beta blockers, reducing negative racial implicit bias. I'd never heard of a study like that. I didn't know studies were done like that. Like, I knew that there were medical studies, you know, just taking biology classes, knowing that they tested medications. But the fact that they were testing negative racial implicit bias was mind-boggling. So the Oxford study was done in the UK, you know, Oxford University. It consisted of 36 white males, white British males, half of which had taken a placebo. The other half had, had taken a beta blocker and they tested the, their IAT score. So the IAT is the implicit association test that pretty much tells you your level of implicit bias. But they found that 30 minutes after taking a beta blocker, the individuals had a significantly reduced score on their IAT. So saying that they experienced or displayed less implicit bias. So a beta blocker, in theory is reducing that anxiety that we feel. It's it's blood pressure medication, and then it helps people um, reduce their blood pressure and their overall tension, like body tension. Um, So like when you feel threatened, your sympathetic nervous system is activated and it induces like that fight or flight uh, mode that we go into where, yeah, our heart rate is stimulated, we're sweaty, we're nervous. A beta blocker is combating that fight or flight reaction that we get, um, I'd say, so that we can think more clearly. Because generally, what we know in psychology is that high levels of anxiety leads to low levels of cognition, so that when we're anxious and stressed, we're often not making great decisions. I mean, this is theoretical, but, like, here's, like, almost, like, here's, like, a magic pill. Oh, my God. They can just give this to someone, and they're less racist? That's awesome. One of my first thoughts was, like, they should really give this to police officers because uh, they were having a really hard time <laughs> uh, controlling themselves, it seems like. My idea was that police officers should be required to take beta blockers or some other form of medical neuro intervention to prevent their implicit biases from acting um, in a way that causes the murder of innocent civilians. 
Natalia wrote a paper about this for her neuroethics class and later submitted it to the International Neuroethics Society's essay contest. She won the contest, got to go to a fancy dinner in Washington, D.C. to accept her award. A year later, another researcher approached her to expand her idea into a longer paper. The title of the paper is Pacifying the Cognitive Monster, Reducing Police Brutality by Means of Mandatory Moral Neuroenhancement. This is what implicit bias is. We're calling it a cognitive monster um, because, you know, implicit bias is something that lives in our cognition. It lives in our minds. And when it comes to police brutality and the murder of um, innocent civilians, it's a monster and it's terrifying. We make the case that moral neuroenhancement should be mandatory for police officers. So we write, anyone who's committed to an egalitarian political ethos should find the current state of affairs deeply offensive and something that cannot go unaddressed. Black Americans in particular are not only significantly more likely to be stopped, searched, and subject to the use of arbitrary force than their white counterparts, but even unarmed black civilians are three and a half times more likely to be shot by police than unarmed white civilians. This raises the question of what justice requires of us. What is a morally appropriate response to this long-standing problem of undue and racially discriminatory police violence? What that means is there's been a history of police brutality and minority civilians being targeted by people in power, people who are supposed to protect us. Um, so, you know, oftentimes these incidences have gone unaddressed and we have to address them. I mean... We should have been addressing them. We shouldn't have let it get this far and this bad. It's a call for action. I'll just continue reading. The automatic activation of implicit biases reduces moral agency by tainting our perception, distorting our judgment, and inducing actions that are independent of our will. Moral neuroenhancement that mitigates the manifestation of implicit bias enhances moral agency by ensuring that our actions are appropriately responsive to the world and our moral identity. So we're saying that moral neuroenhancers are actually giving us more will and more freedom to act morally. How so? I, I, I'm going to go back to the cognitive monster thing. I'd say in my mind, it's like that cognitive monster is holding people back from acting morally. And so having a moral neuroenhancer is a direct attack on that cognitive monster that's holding people hostage in their own minds. And that getting rid of that cognitive monster, people have better agency or have better ability to act morally than they would if they didn't take some sort of moral neuroenhancer. You know, I will say, like, when I first read your paper, I had multiple reactions to it. I initially had a reaction of like, oh, wow, this is really, this is a fascinating idea. If there's this really ubiquitous medication that seems to be relatively harmless in most cases that might have these kinds of effects, that is a really tantalizing idea that maybe this is a solution to a huge problem that is multifaceted and urgent, mm -hmm. the solution that, I mean, according to the study, may be effective within half an hour of people taking this medication. I also see some problems with it. The IAT, the Implicit Association Test, is somewhat controversial now. There are some concerns about the test's reliability in that sometimes people get different scores on different days. And yeah. I also think it's worth acknowledging the this Oxford study that is the basis of your papers is a single study, is a relatively small study. There were 36 participants, half of whom were given a placebo, which means only 18 participants were given beta blockers, which I don't think is to negate your idea, but also worth mentioning that this is based on a relatively small study and relatively small results. Yeah, no, I'm glad you bring that up. You could write a whole book on issues pertaining to data science and pertaining to psychological studies or the replication crisis that's currently ongoing with a lot of social sciences. Yeah, and then like 36 British white males, how relevant is that to an American sample? 
Yeah, so I'd say all your concerns are so valid and definitely concerns of mine as well. But taking a beta blocker or some moral neuroenhancer might be one solution to a really complex, large issue. I'd say pills, in most cases, when they're proposed as a solution, are the quicker, faster, sometimes even cheaper solution. But no, I think that there should be more of like a cultural revolution and like how we're raising people and how we're attracting people to join law enforcement. Despite that being an issue, I think the idea of moral neuroenhancement is a crucial concept that we should be considering because ultimately what society has agreed upon is to have equal rights and equal opportunities for all people. And currently that is not the case. Currently, protection from law enforcement is better for white people than it is for people of color. So something we haven't talked about yet is that beta blockers, they're a pretty ubiquitous medication with a lot of different applications. Mm -hmm. But with as with any medication, there are side effects and there are um, conditions under which you it is not advisable that you take it. So this kind of mandate, you would either have people needing to take medication that could harm them or you would have people who would be disqualified from doing this kind of work regardless of their bias. Even if they were a really good police officer, that would disqualify them yeah. or harm them. Is that preferable to other solutions like training? If you should, No one should be forced to take something that is not good for them, that compromises their health. But I think we should discuss ideas that seem invasive to people's personal rights in order to serve a greater good and to prevent future murders of innocent civilians. We should hold people in power to, like, hold them to their responsibility, like, hold them accountable. And the reason isn't for captivity. It's not for infringing on rights. It's not, you know, it's not for holding a power status of civilians over police officers. It's really so that police officers can do what they said they were going to do so that they can live up to their responsibility um, and to the oath that they take to protect all civilians, not just white ones. And even to join the police force, they have to be physically fit. We're asking them to be morally fit as well. We're trying to liberate them and allowing people to act morally when they otherwise could not. Natalia wrote the paper, Pacifying the Cognitive Monster, Reducing Police Brutality by Means of Mandatory Moral Neuroenhancement. Her co-author is Paul Tubig, a doctoral candidate at the University of Washington's Department of Philosophy. Natalia lives in Seattle. She calls herself an aspiring philosopher and is currently researching PhD programs. I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but when I was in college, I actually worked with cops. I was a public safety assistant at the University Police Department. To be clear, I was not a cop, but I worked with them for years. I got to hear conversations that I wouldn't have heard otherwise. Putting this episode together got me thinking about that job, and I wanted to know how people I worked with would react to Natalia's proposal. I reached out to a few of them, some of whom currently work in law enforcement. I never heard back from those folks, but I did hear back from my friend, Kyler Barton. Kyler also worked for campus security. Again, not a cop, but he worked with cops for years. I sent him Natalia's paper and the Oxford study, and here's some of what he said. This is a tricky proposal. My first thought was, there is no way a police department would implement the use of beta blockers. Though the health risks seem low, I think the objections would be based on issues of officer safety, as well as altering one's mind. Blocking adrenaline might influence an officer's reflexes during a tense exchange that doesn't involve shooting a person. I also thought about body cameras. Body cameras are a tool designed to protect both officers and the public they serve, and many police officers block them or turn them off. 
I'm not saying all cops do this, but I think there is a rebellious attitude, a defiance, that some officers I worked with had toward the public and their own department. However, I think one way to implement beta blockers would be to have officers voluntarily accept the neuroenhancement. Some of the officers I worked with would likely have volunteered. Maybe there could be departmental incentives, and once some of the officers are on beta blockers, they might encourage their coworkers to also try to compromise their own racial biases. Is this a fair intervention? Well, it's trying to walk a fine line between giving an officer bodily autonomy and improving the police's treatment of members of the public. Encouraging people, let alone cops, to alter their brain function seems like a hard sell. Thank you, Kyler Barton, for your thoughts. Would you take a pill if you thought it would make you less racist? Should employers be allowed to make you take drugs to get or keep your job? We want to hear from you. Call us at 765-374-5263. We have a link to Natalia's first paper up on our website, hbmpodcast.com. And once the longer paper that she co-authored is publicly available, we'll post that there too. Again, we're at hbmpodcast.com. Special thanks to Anthony Ferrucci for his invaluable help with research for this episode. Thanks also to KNKX Public Radio for letting me use their studio, specifically Will James, Simone Alisea, Ed Ronco, and Will Stone for lending me gear and letting me into the building at odd hours. I'm Bethany Denton, and I produce this episode with lots of editing help from Jeff Emptman, music by The Black Spot, and Phantom Fauna. Here Be Monsters is distributed by KCRW. Our senior editor there is Kristen Lepore. We get additional support for freelance contributions from KCRW's independent producer project. Thanks for listening. More episodes soon. <laughs>